Good afternoon. This is a this is an update on on the status of HARP and I'm going to talk about some we've carried out two campaigns the last year. We took ownership of HARP, the University of Alaska and the Geophysical Institute. It was in mothballs. We brought it out of mothballs, got it up and running and we're carrying out campaigns. Two of my co-authors, Chris Fallon and Bill Bristow, I'll be showing some of their results. So almost everybody in the room understands the importance of the ionosphere. A lot of us have measured it and modeled it. We measured it with sounding rockets or optical instruments, ionosons, radars, satellites. But if you're looking for a particular phenomenon, you either have to sit on the ground and wait for it to happen or go fly a satellite, get a bunch of data and sort through the data to find it to happen, find, find where it happened. But the beauty of an active facility like HARP is that you can flip a switch and make something happen. If you've got enough power, um, if you can focus gigawatts into a small region of the ionosphere, and there's a lot of stuff you can do. Um, you can create currents, you can create artificial glows, you can create waves, uh, low frequency waves. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite exciting. So, uh, HARP is the, uh, it's located in Gakona, Alaska. It's a phased array of uh, 180 dipoles. It's uh, powered by uh, a bunch of diesel generators, I'll show you that in a minute. And it can transmit anywhere from 2.8 to 10 megahertz, where that energy is absorbed in, in the ionosphere, uh, in the F region. It's very sophisticated, it's a phased array. So we can, we can transmit at multiple frequencies and we can form beams. Um, uh, we, can, we, can, we can transmit with one part of the array at one frequency, another part at another frequency, and, uh, and, and uh, do quite a bit of interesting uh, experiments. It's, um, it has a total transmit power of 3.6 uh, megawatts, which uh, effective radiated power from a phase array can get up into gigawatts. So a little cartoon to talk about how it works. Um, you, you, you transmit from the, from the phased array. Uh, it's either the energy is absorbed in the ionosphere or reflected from the ionosphere. You can uh, m modulate it to generate uh, low frequency waves, ULF, VLF, Whistler waves, Alfane waves. Those waves are either trapped in the Earth ionosphere waveguide, which, which have been used by the Navy for submarine communication or they propagate up along magnetic field lines into the magnetosphere. HARP is located at an L, on about uh, L shell of L equals phi, which is a, a really great location for that kind of thing. It's actually located in a region where the ionosphere is normally quiet, so you can do quiet experiments, but it's also at times uh, the ionosphere is very disturbed by, from the aurora, so it allows you to do both kinds of things. The, the motivation, uh, the Department of Defense spent about $290 million to build HARP, and, and most of the motivation was to, to explore what, to, what would happen if, uh, if, if a nuke went off in space, the radiation belt density went way up, and, uh, and, and look at w if, uh, uh, wave particle uh, interactions to clear up, to clean up the, the magnetosphere, to, to get the uh, trap uh, electrons to, to uh, precipitate down. So with HARP, uh, we can form multiple beams, we can, we can steer the beams, we can run them in circles. We can create air glows, and one of the things that happens when you create an air glow patch, it tends to descend. But, but people have found that if you run it in a circle, you can actually keep that, uh, that region stable and you can create glows, and I'll show you some examples. Uh, you can create ducts, uh, VLF ducts, and then propagate energy up into the magnetosphere, create air glow, uh, waves, VL, I've mentioned the waves already, currents, explore chemistry, uh, create ionization, uh, uh, trigger resonances and instabilities, and study turbulence. So there's four of these heaters in the world. Um, there's one in Norway, one in Russia. Uh, Air Receivo is probably going to be operational again soon. I'm hearing, I'm hearing positive things about that. But in, terms of, in terms of agility, frequency, agility, frequency range, and, and, and overall power, this is a log scale. HARP is the most powerful and can, can address uh, quite a bit of science. The, the Air Force and the Navy uh, built HARP a couple years ago, three years ago. The Air Force said they didn't need it anymore and they were going to destroy it. Uh, the community, a lot of you in the room, spoke up and, and, and the Air Force decided not to destroy it. Uh, the university president said, I'll take ownership, and so now we're, we own it, and, we, and we're, trying to, we're trying to run it and, and uh, make a go of it. Like I said, it's located at, a, at, a, at about L equals 5, which, which allows, allows you to pump energy way out into the magnetosphere for a lot of applications, including um, uh, radiation belt remediation, which was sending waves along the magnetic field lines to change pitch angle distributions and cause electrons to precipitate. And that was uh, the primary motivation, uh, a physics tool for this, for this facility. 
So it's the photographs I mentioned. It's 180 dipoles, um, big capacitors. It's powered by five, uh, five big generators, four tugboat generators and one, and one diesel, one uh, locomotive diesel. Uh, at full power, it can, it can suck 820 gallons of diesel an hour. Uh, <coughs> there's a lot of spares for everything at HARP, including the, the, de the generators. We only run four at a time. There's, there's a fifth as a spare. And we've had all kinds of energy, you know, we've had, we've seen uh, uh, turbochargers leak oil and burn out and things like that, but there's enough spares that, that we were able to, to keep going. When the Air Force uh, moved out of HARP, uh, there was about 30 of these trailers, they took out the vacuum tubes and stored them in, in the main building in these cardboard boxes and shut the heat off. Uh, the, they want, it was, the heat bill gets to be qu uh, quite a bit, we're, we're paying that bill, so I, I understand why they did that. Uh, we put them back. It, it took us a lot longer to put them back than it did for them to take it out. It took us about a month per trailer, for these shelters, because they not only had to be put back, we had to be recalibrated. There's big inductors that have to be lubricated. Uh, right now, we've, there's 30 trailers. We've got uh, 24 of them uh, back in operation, and we'll have the last six. We're 80 percent power. We'll be at 100 percent power uh, by this summer. And like I said, we've carried out um, uh, two campaigns. So our next campaign is scheduled for this coming April. Uh, the shelters uh, shed a lot of heat. They're actually well insulated, but when HARP is running, there's an enormous amount of heat uh, dissipated in those trailers, and so there's plenums that, 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 that blow the heat out. <clears throat> We've been looking at simple innovations to, to save money, like lowering the thermostat and uh, blocking some of the, these are some inf infrared images, is blocking some of the uh, areas where the, where the heat goes out using styrofoam to do this. The, uh, the generators were also in non-compliance for EPA regulations, and it was about a million and a half dollars to get them back into compliance. But working with the EPA and, and the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation and even the local power company, we came up with a scheme to uh, take 10 percent of whatever we generate and, and provide it free to, to a rural community. There's, there's a law that allows you to do that. So we pump 10 percent of our power, we've done this successfully, back into the Copper, Copper Valley uh, Electoral Authority. That 10 percent, they, they guarantee those electrons will make it to rural communities because the rural and the, and the city are, are combined, but they separate those out. That's not our problem. But it saved us from having to make those modifications to do this. So this is a photograph from a few years ago. Um, this is the main road in. Uh, this is the main building where the, where the, where the uh, diesel generators are. This is the array, 33-acre array with the 30 trailers. And then we have diagnostic instruments along this road and, and out here in this, uh, this pad. This is an unmanned aircraft. We have an unmanned aircraft program at the Geophysical Institute, and this is uh, uh, our heart manager flying drones over, over the area. To, to see the, you can see the rheometer and optical, optical buildings. We have a number of operational, we have a number of, of uh, uh, plasma diagnostics. Most of these were taken out when the Air Force left, but it, and after a year or so, we got, a, we got most of them back. So we have the, the same capability we pretty much always have. Uh, we'd still like to have an incoherent scatter radar. I'll talk about that a little bit more maybe in a minute, but Anybody has an idea of a spare incoherent scatter radar they'd like to, to bring to HARP, well, we'd, we'd be willing to, to take it in and use it. But this is enough to do uh, quite a number of experiments. So this is the campaign we carried out last February. These are the experimenters, Dave Heisel, Wayne Scales, Bill Bristow, Dave Sosinski, uh, Paul Bernhardt, and Chris Fallon, and, and a few others. The, the, the two in, in yellow, I'll show some results. Uh, Bill Bristow was, was turning on the heater at different frequencies for, for varying time intervals and looking at scintillation, creating scintillation, and watching how that scintillation decayed away. And uh, Chris Fallon was creating artificial air glow and, and doing some radio frequency experiments. So this is super darn radar uh, observations um, of HARP. This row here around 750 uh, shows you uh, various regions of scintillation that Bill Bristol was able to create uh, by varying the frequency, first of all, and then uh, varying the on-off time. He did similar experiments a few years ago and was able to uh, uh, cal uh, calculate decay times of these, uh, these simulations, which are, which are comp comparable to the diffusion rates. Paul Bernhardt and, and others, Dave Zizinski, are interested in creating scintillation. Uh, Bernhardt did an experiment in, uh, in 2015 where he, we was communicating with TACSAT 4 at UHF, flip a switch, create bubbles, and, and sever that connection. So these are two of the motivations for those experiments. Chris Fallon created an artificial air glow. This is an image, all sky image at 6,300 angstroms. Again, by, by scanning the, uh, the, the beam in a circle, he's, he creates this patch of, of ionization and, and accelerates electrons and keeps it stable there. Uh, this is a trick we learned from our, our colleagues at uh, Arecibo. 
Chris, in that, as part of that same experiment, he tacked on some slow scan TV imagery and uh, put in our Geophysical Institute logo and our university logo. We're picked up in Colorado and British Columbia by ham operators and sent back, back to us. So these aren't real dedicated experiments for the communication, but it gives you an idea of, uh, of how this would work. And we have the, given that this is the most powerful HF radio in the world and we're in a great location, we can send signals pretty much anywhere, and uh, which could be used for things like emergency broadcast messages um, and things like that. So, so, so near the end here, we have a, Alaska is a great place to study the ionosphere. Um, it's a, tr it's a tremendous laboratory. Uh, we have instruments all around Alaska. These are, these are GPS uh, receivers. We have a rocket range. We launch rockets into the world. We're launching next couple weeks four rockets. Uh, we're launching out of Poker Flat. At Poker Flat is the Pfizer incoming scatter radar that, that we talked about. This is HARP, which is down here in Kakona. Uh, we have a number, some of these instruments include all sky cameras and, and uh, ionosons. We have a new digison we're putting in at, at, at Poker. Uh, there's also the Super Darn radar uh, facility. There's three of them in, in Alaska, one at uh, uh, ADAC, one at Kodiak Island, and then on the mainland. So in summary, uh, Alaska is a fantastic laboratory to study the ionosphere. It's highly instrumented. We have rockets and, and heaters and, and nuclear scatter radars. Uh, we own HARP. This is, this is an interesting, interesting experiment. Um, we're uh, conducting campaigns. We can do it whenever we want. Uh, but we're paying the bills, and so, so I keep reaching out to the scientific community, all of you. Please propose to your favorite uh, funding organization to come do science at HARP. We've had, we've had people come from the Navy. The Air Force, is, I believe, is coming back soon. Uh, Department of Energy and, and National Science Foundation has funded, has funded support. We're trying to find an anchor tenant. Uh, at Poker Flat, our, our sounding rocket range, we actually have, a, we have NASA as an anchor tenant. If we can find an anchor tenant like that, uh, this would be great. HARP was being operated at about seven million a year. Uh, we've got it down to less than two. So this is, and by, and by paying the bills, it's a strong motivation to keep the, keep the cost down and, and uh, keep the marching armies to a uh, to minimum. The Air Force made sure there were spares for everything at HARP. It's, it's, it's as, as, as powerful and as exquisite as it always was. Um, I mentioned that we're trying to get an incoherent scatter radar there or, or build a new one. It's a community facility. We're running it, but the community it's for the community, so please, uh, uh, please come use it. And we're open to uh, international experimenters. And thanks.